2021 has been a huge year for Magic to the point where it's tough to recall it all. So today we go step by step through the year and resample some of the best flavour from the past 12 months. Welcome to Magic the Flavouring, the Magic the Gathering podcast where we talk about all things Magic, flavour design and lore. I'm your host Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. And we are doing our 2021 MTG Year in Review. Oh baby, boop, boop, boop. it's oh, been yeah. a big year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been it a has. big old year, man. Like, geez, Louise. And you know what? The year is not even really even done as we're recording this. So, th- so this is going to be. We're recording this all in one go. This is probably going to be two episodes. So we're doing a massive monster record, and then we'll probably chop it up somewhere in the middle, and then we'll release this in two parts because obviously there's just there's too much to talk about. But we're recording this on the 16th of December um, at. 10 to 11 uh gmt uh time or whatever we're in now gmt plus one i don't know uh uk time um and they are going to be doing uh an announcement and some card reveals for kamigawa neon dynasty like tonight our time Mm -hmm. and obviously by the time this episode comes out that'll be like a few days away so we're already we're doing the year in review and we still haven't even finished the year in review and there's like two weeks left of the entire year so uh yeah interesting yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of it's been a busy year. I mean, there's been a, there's been a lots of stops and starts, but Magic Magic the Gathering for one hasn't. <laughs> Magic the Gathering has trucked on, and gee whiz, is it trucked on hard? Um, yeah. It's been quite a year, quite a year, and it's quite interesting because we didn't get to do one of these last year because we were kind of only in what the formative kind of stages of of the pod, so it wasn't really. We, we did a we did of... a highs and lows episode where we talked about our favorite things and our unfavorite things, but I, I I think it was just us kind of nitpicking bits and bobs, which I've I've already done a bit of on Twitter, so I think this is us just going to go sort of like throughout the year and just kind of see what we're, yeah, blow by blow. What we're thinking of. Yeah, so the way the way we're also formatting this, just to make it a bit more interesting, is uh, Nathan's going to take the lead on this one and has kind of looked into like beat for beat what has happened throughout this year and kind of, you know, rejigged his memory. And obviously we did episodes on this because we're a magic podcast. We've done episodes on pretty much everything that we're going to talk about today. Um, but I have done no revision whatsoever I have nothing in front of me except for our recording software. I haven't looked at any articles, any kind of breakdowns of the year. I have not revised on any of the cards. And we're going to see if someone who's revised everything versus someone who who can barely remember what's happened this year, what kind of reactions mm-hmm. we're going to have come out of like the, the sets that have happened this year. Because it's kind of a running joke with the amount of products that have happened that people can't remember what's gone on, right? So we're going to see. We're going to see if that's true. Um I like to think I've got a half decent memory. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think I was. I was I th- I th- it's funny, right? Because I look back. I, I've obviously got it all in front of me. I look back at it now, and I'm like, "Oh, okay." So it was only that much stuff. And then you look a little bit deep, and you go, uh, "Okay, there was also that." And then you go, uh, "Okay, there was also that." Oh, okay, fuck. All right, Jesus. Okay, cool. That was all in one yeah. year. All right, okay, great, fantastic. Uh-huh. I mean, I still can't. I still. I, I still struggle to remember whether or not Commander was was the Commander <laughs> the Commander Legend set was was part of this year or not. I was like, I swear, Etch Foils came out this year. No. No, no it's 2020. Yeah. Apparently, that was 2020. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, cool. So, what would yeah. I guess? Yes. No, go ahead. Good. <laughs> I was gonna say, I guess what we'll do is we'll do like a um, I'll do like a little blow. We'll do blow by blow, and then we can go back and kind of look at things in more depth. Because obviously, each set has its own kind of like um environment, right? It, it has its um, themes, it has its mechanics, it has its story relevance, all that kind of shit. Um, but first and foremost, we'll just kind of go blow by blow through the year. Um, and it's funny because I, I had, you had a page up, which is essentially the uh, product list from the MTG Wiki, which is exactly what I had up, um, just to do a blow by blow. Uh, and the first thing, January 28th, is a release of mobile version of MTG Arena on Android. Oh, sure. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. I played a lot of that. Yeah. I mean, my disclaimer, I think mostly for this is that there are a lot of things that release to Arena, and when I didn't have enough time to play Paper Magic, you think that would give me more time to play Arena Magic, right? No, the whole point is I didn't have enough time to play Arena Magic either. So kind of a lot of the Arena releases, because there were a lot of them, everything from um, historic uh, releases um, to different edits to, to cards that are unique to arena all of this stuff mm. has happened this year but none of it is necessarily particularly person to paper magic which is what we're going to kind of focus on in these two episodes because that's one what we play a lot of yeah and two 
Otherwise, this episode this episode will be really, really, really long. Yeah. So, yeah, I did. I, I mean, I say I didn't have any revision or anything. I literally, I did at, about five minutes ago have that um, MTG wiki breakdown. And you were like, no, don't take it down. And I was like, oh, okay. And the, the only thing I saw in there was the release for Arena on mobile. Um, I actually did, when that did release, play... A, a decent amount. It's funny that we, I've already like I've already diverted from you in terms of my approach to Magic this year. I don't th- think I played a hell of a lot of it beyond Strixhaven? Question mark. I haven't. I certainly haven't played any uh, Innistrad at all on Arena whatsoever. Um, yeah, but that was cool. It worked. It was fine. Yeah, were you playing any other formats other than like just like like drafts and 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 like brawl. you know standardy kind of sets? Were you were doing brawl as well? Because I mean, I think that's one of the things that got me got me interested in arenas where they started doing kind of like um, the non-standard formats. And I don't mean standard as in the the format that is called standard as in standardized formats. You know, like say obviously they're not going to put modern and extended and legacy into arena because good god can imagine having the the, the, the catalogue of cards in there but mm. i quite liked these like flexible kind of formats i know that historic's obviously been quite big on arena but i really enjoyed brawl i really enjoyed um what was there was another one they did that was similar didn't they was it, what was hmm, what on arena was brawl. When, when we, yeah it was like, that's the planeswalker and you choose a signature spell right and then and then the rest of the decks kind of built oh uh, that that's that's oath card. breaker it's still single cards Oathbreaker, that was it. That was the other one. Yeah. So I, I quite like these kind of like quirky formats that you can kind of throw together in arena that you can't necessarily because you haven't got other people to play it in paper, right? You can kind of just throw a small catalogue of cards together and kind of see what you can do with it, which I thought was a really good way for me to use up like wild cards and stuff, because obviously wild card economy being a bit so I, I didn't really want to invest into like standard um sets um or really yeah. or, or you know, invest into normal competitive decks. So it was quite nice just to go, well, I only need one shark typhoon. So cool. I guess I'll make one of those up and and play around with Nasa, You know. Yeah, I th- I think uh, I think Brawl is definitely a better one v one format than it ever was like a four player format like they tried to to do. But I mean, mm. this, this is, uh, your point is that this is a flavor podcast, right? And uh, other than some of the unique cards that they've kind of filtered into, um, like they did the unique jumpstart cards, didn't they? And they've done unique cards mm. essentially for uh, alchemy. Um, we did a whole episode on this and how the fact that yes, all right, there are flavor beats to be had in in arena, but it is mostly paper magic, and that yeah, that is what we play. So yeah, arena, cool. That was a mobile release, but yeah, we probably won't talk about arena much this yeah. year. No, and I think generally next year they'll probably do a lot more of an emphasis on this. I think alchemy is a good side of like them divorcing the two sides of it in a, in a way that seems healthy. So next year I think there'll be a little bit more to say about it. Um, moving on from there. Um, quite early in the year how early in the year do you reckon cow time was oh february february Mm, yeah february 5th so like really really early in the year yeah really early in the year um and what's interesting about um cow time so basically there were two new sets so two two new uh planes or two new set planes and then two um and two two old set or old yeah. plane sets yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we look at the two the two strads versus cow time and strixhaven so i have it two two and two and then in brackets plus the one and we'll get to the plus one in a little bit because i think that's probably one of the more interesting things to talk about um from, from this year um but yeah it's funny that all the way back in february this is the first time that we had like um the phyrexians kind of come in and kind of like the last we've kind of seen of them apart from a couple like story mentions um oh recently. yeah i completely forgot right? that Warren Klex was in that <laughs> isn't that right? mad that was you know? so big at the time i have not exactly. thought about it's that cute. since strixhaven when jinka taxis didn't show up in strixhaven i have not thought about that at all that's so funny yeah it's crazy right and i think this is kind of a clever point of i think a lot of people and again we'll get to this when we start talking story aspects later um but i think it's a very interesting point that they started feeding this long arc in as early as february 2021 didn't touch on it again really until you know like the end of the year and then we're likely to see a little bit more of it obviously next year um and i kind of like the fact they're taking it slowly i feel like it, it feels like um maybe there were complaints that the story jumps around too much and they're too nebulous and they're too too individual and they don't necessarily have a lot of gravity in the grand arc but it's quite nice to see that they had these fe- these little feelings out and the way they, yeah. they released foreign clothes i thought it was really clever i thought the yeah, way they really did that little secret reveal right at the end no one was really expecting it unless you were like you know you're paying paying mind to the leaks and it kind of came out of left field and everyone's sat there going duff 
the fuck is this? How's 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 Vorenglitz got on there? You know, and again from again, I, I think what we'll probably do is we'll probably talk story separate from just general view, and I think we'll talk that um, talk about that later because we can get into like the nitty gritty of, of yeah, ramifications sure. and all that nonsense. Um, but yeah, all the way back in February, we had our first Phyrexian creature type, and this obviously then led to a lot of a rattering of past cards. And when I'm in a load, I mean a load. Mm. Like I think it was over a hundred cards ended up getting a ratted to Phyrexian. Um, so yeah, very 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 cool. Um, February twelfth. Uh, um, was the release of the sequel air drop series smitten um andy yo big question here <laughs> how many secret air drops do you think they've been this year oh here we go i knew i was going to be asked this i could <laughs> feel it uh how many secret air drops or bundles uh drops individual drops considering right, okay. that we had up to the beginning of 2021 we had 34 oh, total crikey. up to the beginning of 2021 how many oh, do you reckon man. there are now in this year 2021 yep uh, I'm going to shoot for 55. God, okay. Well, you did go for a large number. Oh, well, that kind of takes the wind out of the sails a little bit. Um, 45. We went from oh, 34 okay. drops at the beginning of the year to well, 79 at the end. That's fine. Like that's That's fine. That's one every eight days. Yeah, but they bundled a lot of them. This is what they've done now, is instead of doing, like... <laughs> sure, I, I know, sure. I don't, it doesn't make it sound any better, really, I suppose, but the fact that they did, like, release them in bundles, I suppose, means that they obviously had just lots of ideas that they... Like, they want to sell the bundles, don't they? They don't want to sell the individual ones. They want to sell, like... Of course. You know what I mean? There's a lot of money to be made there, so I kind of see that makes sense. Um, yeah. And also, also, a lot of them are that cheat where they do like a cycle of 10 cards or a cycle of six cards and then they split them up into four or five different drops you know what i mean like who's buying just one of the shock land ones or one of the down fraser signet ones right i suppose yeah i suppose that's a good point um and also when you look through like the diversity is quite absurdly varied um, I think mm. it's more massive. I think this is the the first indication because um, you don't really notice it as you're going through the uh, product line list. Um, I don't know how they kind of got over. I think it's because they they list it as bundles instead. But when you look at it as a series of um, of the individual drops, like it is quite galling. And this is where like the FOMO aspect I think first kind of creeps in of where when you're having to spend like when it's almost once a week you're putting in that little investment of kind of in- interesting premium cards that also you don't get for like half a year later, which is another, you know, bone to pick. I think that's my biggest issue with secret air drops recently. It hasn't been the variety, hasn't been the pace because again, I don't mind missing out on some of these because they make them so diverse that some of them very much do not appeal to me, which mm. is good. Um, whereas other ones absolutely do. So I kind of clamor to make sure I get them. Um, I think the biggest, um, issue is is the time between purchase and then the time of having them in the hand so where yeah okay it's almost like you you invest in the future right if you go oh i'm gonna buy a present for myself and i'm not sure when i'm gonna quite get it and then one day it comes to you like ah oh, i forgot i bought this oh i kind of took apart the deck that, that i bought this card for actually so i guess it sits in a binder now yay <laughs> you know? here's my thoughts and feelings on it is that um a lot of the secret airdrops for recent, especially like because I remember the Caldheim one specifically and the Strixhaven one. Um, oh, they've they've done it for every set. Is that they do at least one now per set where it's just that set's mm. showcase style, but just with like cards that weren't in the set, or at least in the case of Strixhaven, ones they couldn't be asked to put in the Mystical Archive in the first place. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> I kind of feel like not that coupled with a lot of the other sort of like very niche styled ones, and then the broader styled ones like on the flip side. It, it it kind of it's almost so much now that it the issue of well I can't possibly buy everything this product clearly isn't for me it's almost like no not everyone is going to be for you this is secret layer territory and it's like if they did only like maybe three a year you would want each of them to be exactly the thing that you wanted it's a bit like when people get dis- disappointed with commander decks when there was only like one commander set per year people would get disappointed if they weren't into that particular set of the commander decks whereas. I think if you have an abundance, like so many secret layers that you can't even keep track of which ones are which, it's almost like then you do, if you are into buying secret layers, you do get to pick and choose. Like, it's not good for people who want to have every single one of them, but then I Mm. don't really empathize with those people. (laughs) So it sounds really cruel. But like, if you are a person who is in a position where you probably could buy every single one, we're not playing the same game. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Like, we're we're not engaging with it in the same way anyway. So yeah, I kind of feel like broadly looking at it as a year in review 
the amount of secret layers that have come out is absurd if you're not into the idea of a secret layer, but it's actually really good if you're into the idea that secret layers are giving players really interesting individual personalized like drops for cards that they want. Do you know what I mean? No, absolutely. I get it. It's one of that drip, that drip free kind of aspect of if you're going to be doing such. Um, I think we we thought about this that first super drop that came out right with the lightning bolts, the ornitho- the ornitho- the ornithology collection. Not, not becoming any easier to say, has it? <laughs> I know, right? Jesus Christ. Um, and it's it's that's a prime example, right? And this is where the super drops come in, which I think is really good is that they do almost that throw throw the entire spaghetti at the, at the, at the wall and hope hope it all sticks because you are going to please different people at different times and that's exactly what the product's supposed to be i think the pace of super drops is maybe a touch too quick i didn't mind when it was like a super drop and then it was like this specific one based on this charity or this specific one based on like women's day that those kinds of products i think are fine i think the problem is when you get like super drop and then they go it's the october super drop i'm like can we not name it monthly can we now name it seasonally at least so i feel like there's a bit of a break you know i think that's i think that's where where maybe my fatigue comes in of where I know that I want to consume and I'm at a point in my life where I have the disposable income to kind of like get away with it. I mean, I know some people that will just also buy, also purchase, you know, the bundles with regardless because their funding isn't necessarily a big concern to them. Um, where and also I've started going to get into a point where I really like blinging out my decks. I used to hate foiling. I used to hate there being one card wrong in a, in a playset. If I was playing four of a card, they had to all be different or they had to all be the same. And that kind of conformity, I've kind of let go a little bit. Like I don't mind foils in my commander decks. I don't mind my uh, commander being a, a different style to the rest of the deck. And I've got one deck that I specifically try to flare on every single card for. So again, maybe it's my my um, tendencies have changed a little bit, and this is just kind of like the lay of the land i can't imagine magic without secret layers now like cards used to look so boring well do you know what i I think i think it's interesting like especially from a flavor point of view in terms of not necessarily narrative but from a like a how you're engaging with the game from an artistic and sort of like emotional level if you like like a visual level um that's a lot of different words that don't mean the same thing and i've just used them interchangeably (laughs) um (laughs) you know what i mean though um is that you you have as someone who's been playing for decades now evolved with the game as the game has changed so the game is doing more different card styles they're doing different like artistic styles they're doing different like mechanical styles and it's diversifying at a huge pace and you as a player whether through like determination or just through like naturally because you you like the game of magic the gathering go figure you are evolving with it to adapt to that you're not putting like all of these art styles in every single deck. You're not necessarily making concessions for every single like format that you play or whatever else, this, that, and the other. But you have gone, oh, I know I have a deck where I want every card to look different. And oh, look at this. It's amazing. I get to utilize all these different showcases and all these different, like, you know, different card styles and whatever else. And that's a good thing if you want to play Magic the Gathering. Don't get me wrong, you don't have to do it, and there are plenty of people out there who would love to be like very purist about it. Like I'm like I myself try to only put those showcases and things, I think, where they need to be. And it does become difficult sometimes. Like, for example, um I I, I built a Zafai deck, the the Thunder Conductor slash collector from the Strixhaven uh, <laughs> <laughs> from the Strixhaven uh commander decks. And just trying to get foil versions of the basic basic lands from Strixhaven right like i don't even did Strixhaven even do special lands i don't think they did um but even they just trying to get know. just trying to get foil basics i had to buy them like bulk wholesale from card market or something like they weren't even like they weren't even in abundance enough to have like just in booster packs and things cuz that foil slot was taken up with so many other things you know that the foil lands are actually a lot rarer nowadays even though i want to go for like a more basic streamlined look because what i wanted was the art of prismari campus cuz each of the colors had one of the two like houses schools not houses um from strixhaven on their land art right so i think it's interesting how like it's it's kind of this weird push pull and it is going in two directions but from your own admission, as someone who used to hate all that stuff, you are now adapting to it to the point where you're disappointed that there isn't maybe more of that. And like normal magic cards, quote unquote, look too normal now, which is mm. kind of wild, really. Yeah, I mean, we. That's, I guess this segues quite nicely into, because um, it's good, because we've kind of talked about like product um, diversity as well as the way they sell it. Let's look at now, say, 
card stock diversity because yeah it's not just the secret layers that push the envelope massively everything from the movie posters to pixel art the kind of things that you don't see on a magic card right the kind of things that, that feel like the latest one what was the um i can't remember what it's called uh, the shit one sec one sec one sec the mischief the mschf uh one for example that's one of the most bizarrest magic products i think i've ever seen and will likely see in a long time like you know the one with the teferi's puzzle box and it's got like it's just the art styles in it is just so bizarre and so strange that it's almost like um alien right it's almost like the, the, how far can you push the envelope and we've said this before in, in years back of how far can you push the envelope before a magic card feels like a magic card i feel like that's kind of i feel like that's it when you've got a card that peels back an eye planes that has a golf course on it to be a plateau not a plateau a sacred foundry or whatever underneath it like what the hell are wizards doing these days but taking away those absolute bizarre radical sides the extreme as it were even day-to-day magic cards like now we've got set boosters and collector boosters which obviously all came in um last year with zendikar and they have continued through all of the sets we now have most um sets having at least something very specific to them that is artistically um different in terms of like the border or in terms of the art style be it um imagine like remember when we first looked at the nyx lands and we were like oh okay, maybe this is just something I'll do once in a while. And then look like fast forward to Innistrad, the Innistrad lands, for example. Yeah. Like they clearly want to do this. They want to make that there's something. And then also even looking forward to the infinity, they clearly want to um, almost, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, when something orbits, uh, they want the the center of of a set to be identifiable visually as something very different to the set that came before. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the same. Mystical Archives, Cal Times, um, Celtic kind of um, alternate borders. I mean, every set's got alternate borders, right? Um, even between the Innistrad sets, Midnight Hunt looked very different to it, to uh, Crimson Vow. Uh, Strixhaven had the Mystical Archives, and then Cal Time had uh, the, the Celtic kind of borders, the um, runic kind of edging to it. And if every single set's going to have this idea of where it doesn't just have like the normal looking cards, but also cards that are very specific to to the setting and then also on top of that an art style maybe for the lands or something that is very specific to the setting currently then you've got automatic diversity just in your standard sets let alone your supplemental products let alone um things like secret air drops which feel exceptionally ancillary not even as like a supplemental set which probably actually do things slightly less radical now than the standard sets do mm. and it's kind of interesting that now you look at a card pool from across the year and you could argue that they look like different games if it wasn't for the fact you can read their card boxes and see that the formatting of the power and toughness is the same the um, vernacular is the same and the way that they you know type lines and the titles and the mana symbols that's all the same Apart from that, they are they do look like very different card games. And I think that's something that they're clearly pushing more into. And if you look at again next year, Neon Dynasty compared to um New Capella compared to they're going back to Dominaria, again we're gonna have massive visual diversity just in the standard sets, let alone moving into secret layers. Interesting that you say that. Uh I don't know if this is something we'll we'll save for like later on the episode, but I actually have quite high hopes for next year in terms of its visual identity and in terms of where the game is going to go like uh flavorfully and i kind of feel like a lot of the the issues surrounding like people worried about magic not being magic anymore is actually kind of weirdly going to go sort of like full circle um i don't know uh, maybe we'll talk about next year maybe towards the end yeah yeah sure absolutely yeah um it's good because it kind of leads into thou um thematically with looking at diversity because um the announcement of universes beyond came in february 25th Mm. um, which was just after um, a couple of secret air drops and this is now talking about taking outside ips and bringing them into magic and we already knew at this point about D &D universes uh, not universes beyond um, eventually the forgotten realm we already knew that there was going to be this massive wizards of the coast crossover which to this day i still cannot believe did not happen earlier i don't mm. know what they were holding out for but it seems like they dropped it at the exact right time we'll get to this obviously when, when we get to the set but this is they're looking talking about things like warhammer lord of the rings um stranger things other ips that are then being introduced into the in, in, introduced into the format of magic kind of encompassing their story um not necessarily following other pop culture um as we've kind of seen with lord of the rings it's not going to show the film version of it it's going to show the book version and kind of magic kind of putting its own swing on it so it does sit kind of separate because as you said there was a lord of the rings training game but that followed more closely with the films right so it's kind of nice Uh, well well so so fantasy flight did a living card game that was actually 
more the Tolkien sort of like standard. But I think they also they've done things like top trumps and stuff for the films as well. Um, but I just don't I don't think Fantasy Flight are making that game anymore. I could be wrong. Um, oh, okay, so they aren't going to be treading on each other's heels. Okay, that makes I don't a lot think more sense. So. Yeah, but the fact that they're going to the fact that they're now introducing other IPs into into the game, you know, shooty plasma gun guns, pew pew, as well mm. as magic that we know we already know the systems of magic that takes place in all of the rings. And this is kind of why I thought D and D um, Adventure of the Forgotten Realm was kind of interesting. And again, we'll get to it in just a second. Um, but how they format other known meta universes into magic the magic system you mm. know like there is a very specific tapping into ley lines of magic and it obviously, obviously each set and each plane handles its magic differently there's a different vocabulary of like of, of magic in each set which we kind of don't talk about that much we kind of just go yes they've slapped a blue symbol on it cool mm. guess it makes it a blue card it's like well how does that how how is an artificer using blue magic differently say than like a, a merfolk you know we don't really talk about that very much which is something we probably should at some point but it's, it's going to be interesting to see how you define Warhammer cards as magic cards, you know. But having seen the first, like, initial bits of it, I kind of have a lot of faith that they're going to be doing a pretty good job of that and, and making that feel like it sits... It could potentially sit within the magic world, but not within its universe. Yeah, I think so. I don't want to, like, directly just plug other podcasts because that means that... Not because I don't want people to listen to them, but because... You know, it just kind of means that you know anything we say beyond that will will be just the same sort of thing. But um, uh, there's an episode of Dice to Removal with uh, the Professor and, and Pleasant Kenobi. I think at time of recording, it's the most recent one that they've done. And Pleasant Kenobi started getting into to Warhammer 40k quite a bit. The Professor was saying this exact thing of like, "Oh, how is Warhammer 40k going to be magic? It doesn't seem like magic to me." And actually, there is a, a huge swathe of like magic and mysticism and sort of faith and religiosity all encompassed into Warhammer 40k that I think people will be pleasantly surprised about. And this is something that Pleasant Kenobi was talking about, that actually I think a lot of these IPs, which seem like they're really alien, it's only because that that's like a skin deep difference. Whereas actually the the kind of the lore and the, the way that the magic works, like it is actually a lot more similar and a lot more kind of like passable then i think people will kind of give it credit for an initial inspection um but we'll, yeah we'll maybe talk about that a bit more when we sort of talk about what's coming up next year okay so so moving on to march 19th and the release of probably the most forgotten set um if if if, if we're being mean time spiral remastered was that before or after strixhaven that was before like quite a no, bit before. was it yeah quite a bit before like a, a month and a half before or a because, month, right, a month so I haven't a week. I haven't spoken about this a lot on the on the uh podcast before because I didn't want to like kind of I don't know, conflict of interest like with like brands, whatever. So I, I had a job at the start of this year, because obviously lockdown and stuff, which was I kept alluding to it as I've been working with magic cards. I, I was a card grader at Magic Madhouse for a while. Um I don't know why I didn't mention it. I think it's because, you know, like, people might have opinions about the company that I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. I I was a card grader at like Magic Madhouse, which is a big <laughs> distributor in the UK of, of uh, card games and and board games and stuff, um, and specifically grading um, Magic cards. And I was there during the release of Time Spiral Remastered and Strixhaven, and I opened up a lot of product for them and graded a lot of product from those two sets. And I would have sworn blind that Time Spiral Remastered came after Strixhaven. That is so. Mm weird i don't know what that says about magic it just shows that my memory of it is very warped i don't know yeah well i think this is a perfect in this is this was for me the jump start of 2021 jump start was the was the the product that had such automatic potential and realistically from what i've heard look listening from from a lot of feedback was still one of the best introductory um products um, ever created by 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 Wizards of the Coast for newer players to get involved with, because the problem with the average player now being a commander player is it's really hard to get into commander if you're just like literally never played the game before, because mm. it's a lot. You can, you've got the entire pool of cards, you've got specific mechanics that are only used in commander. The decks are huge. I mean, it's it's hard for most like season players to shuffle a hundred cards, let alone a newer player. And then mm. you've got like you, you never see you, you don't see those repeated cards over and over and over again. You don't get that repetition of mechanic every game's on something vastly different they're gone for three hours and you lose interest by turn six none of this is a good experience for a first time um, no. magic player but jumpstart 
is. It's perfect. Here's a tiny little thematic pack that has some potent nonsense in it, as well as your general generic, oh, they're all flyers kind of thing. You mash it together with another theme and you see those themes either complement each other, not working with each other, or the synergies kind of playing without without noticing. And then you just do it again. You take all those cards apart, you mash up two others, and you can do that all afternoon. And before you know it, you understand all the colors, you understand the themes of the colors, the flavor of the colors, the ways they all interact with each other. And you can do that all in an afternoon, yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as get as well as opening an Allosaurus rider and being able to eat for the next three months. You know, that's the kind of shit you can do with Jumpstart and it's so popular they will be doing it again next year but i felt like it came out during the pandemic so it was a really hard product one to get your hands on which made a lot of the cards uh, super sought after which meant they were hoarded rather than you know bought for playing like some people buy booster boxes to draft some people buy them to crack and you know sell on or trade on or whatever and it felt like this wasn't a you, you crack them for the for the value you, you're supposed to sit there and play with them and they didn't get their time to breathe time spiral remastered for me was this it was the exact um same thing of where it was already in the system i feel like if they could have not done a product and somehow saved money off of doing it i think time spiral was probably the one that they would have stopped doing because mm. it was entirely reprint um and yes they did introduce the old school border again which uh, I mean, again, this is the throwback set, right? It's the throwback set for, for this is the opposite of, of Jump Side in terms of instead of getting new players involved in the game, it was giving, throwing a bone to the older players and going, hey, remember all these cards you used to play with? Because a lot of these, I'm looking at the card list now, a lot of these kind of hit me in the fields of being like, oh, shit, I remember opening this card and think it was the nuts. And, oh, I remember this card as well. It, it, it just gives me all of the nostalgia feels, right? But it just didn't have the time to breathe. It didn't get to it, get played very well, um, very much. It didn't get open very much. Um, and a lot of the reprint equity fine but otherwise not hugely notable so otherwise had i had it, had the, out of all of the sets that came out last uh, this year this is the one that i would i struggled the most to remember coming out and i think the only reason i remembered it doing so is because of the old school border well this is it the, the old school border is exactly it isn't it because we've just spoken for about 15 minutes about how this was the year that they really really pushed the idea that you know magic cards could look different i expect we'll be saying the same thing next year as well we said this last year and i think our ups and downs were like oh they're really pushing what magic looks like we've just said it now we'll say it again in 2022 um probably <laughs> they'll get even weirder with it but th- this is a year where they've really gone like right every mainline set has to have like three different showcases or whatever make magic look diverse and then times by remastered is the oh let's make modern magic cards or magic cards with modern and uh uh what did we land on? Modern and modern frames, and then what's the most recent frames? Post magic. I don't uh, know. Uh, yeah, post modern. <laughs> the origins. Post origins. Right? Post origins. There we go. Yes. We'll call it that. Yeah. So, um, you know, magic cards with modern and origin frames will give the old border treatment too. You know, and it'll be amazing, and everyone will like buy all these cards, and it will make it look more like magic for some people. Like for for a lot of people, I feel like this was them going, oh. This is what magic means to me, which is all fine, all power to you. Um, but I think, do you know what? Oh, this might be this might be a hot take. I think one of the reasons it was so forgettable, and I I haven't spoken to anyone that thought uh, has remembered this set that fondly, is because I think maybe the nostalgia factor for people isn't as strong as the. I want to evolve with the game factor. I think maybe that's proven it now, maybe a little bit once and for all, that people who go, no, magic for me is 1997, you know, and you go, cool, all right then. But actually for everyone else, it's it's as the game is now. It's now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Well, like... I get, yeah, we didn't lead with this, but this is the 29th year of magic's existence. It's nearly three decades old. How do you throw a bone back far enough whilst not throwing it too far there was now that you've now got generations of magic players right you've got the boomers and the zoomers you know that is and there's and there's also generations between you've got the boomers the zoomers the gen z is in between and who who are you appealing to at this point i mean i know that time spiral itself the original time spiral set was a throwback set every single card was a reference it wasn't necessarily a reprint but every single card in the set was a reference to one or more cards every single card is like oh it's that's 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 a that's a throwback to that person from that time or oh that mechanically does this or that mixes these two things together and now you've done a throwback set to a throwback set at that point i don't feel like you're you, you don't it's almost like um doing a retro mark ronson song after he's done a retro version of another song sure, you know like yeah, you yeah. can't you can't just keep repurposing because it will start to dilute to the point of where you lose the taste right and unless you do something markedly different like you know the old school border which was inspired i think it was a great fantastic choice oh, i liked again, it, it was... i liked the cards they put it on don't get me wrong yeah, yeah. 
It's fine. But there wasn't anything groundbreaking about the set. There wasn't anything that pulled you in beyond the whole, oh, let's have a little look back. And again, in a, in a, in a, in a year where there was already a lot coming out, and we knew there was a lot coming out, in a year where we, there wasn't as necessarily as much time to play or as much money to spend, it's very easy for these sets to then fall to the side because they kind of feel like, oh, well, we might as well. And then the, well, we might as well sets kind of going to, well, you didn't have to, depending on, you know, their relevance, their prevalence, and, you know, the, the amount of want that people have for them. I mm. mean, don't get me wrong, there were some amazing choices, like, you know, giving a new artworks to people like Saf- Safi Eric's daughter, and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I don't think there was anything groundbreaking from the set, which is unfortunate, because I feel like, I think it's probably a good indication for them that they did it, and it was fine, and no one hated it, but it kind of showed to them that maybe they don't need to do it again, or at least not not for a while. Isn't it, isn't it funny that the Time Spiral Remastered set a lot of the most memorable cards from that set are cards that are played in formats that have really only come to prevalence in like the past sort of five or six years. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, funny, right? Yeah, it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't. It's not as if like it's uh, rejigging, you know, legacy or or, or or vintage. Those formats are still in existence, right? They, they, they still exist. That's they are, mate. Themselves. But like, unless you play Mutgo or have a bundle of cash, right? Yeah. I think there's a big, obviously, statement. We'll probably get to this towards the end of the episode as well, kind of talking about the formats of the of, of the game because I feel like things like standard and stuff are just kind of phasing slowly but surely out. And I don't know if Arena is or isn't helping in that regard to keep standard feeling fresh and prevalent or not. But I feel like um, we know that Commander is like the, the primary format of the of the. Of the um, of, of the game and that will have large sweeping ramifications going forwards in, in terms of like you know their business model and what they feel like they need sets to be doing and stuff like that so maybe sets like time spiral just won't happen as much anymore hmm. um but, cool yeah interesting uh right moving on we then have um release of challenger decks so this okay. goes, kind of goes against that. And that's just basically the fact that they, they started releasing, um, because they keep making standard sets with all these crazy mythic splashy kind of things that are meant for other formats and other stuff. They also then released decks that essentially like, here, here's, here's the standard deck of the of the season. If you want to kind of get in while it's still got a few weeks left of it, <laughs> buy, buy, this, buy this deck and you Ch- can probably have a good time playing with it. Aren't a new thing for this year though, are they? Uh, no, but it's, yeah. it's it's interesting that they continued them in a year where it felt like Standard might have been taking a backseat, which kind of shows that they don't want to quite give up on it yet. I feel sure. like there's an unwritten statement for that, you know, but I mean, we'll see again next year if that changes. Um, moving into April, April 23rd, Strixhaven, Yay! School of Mages. Strixhaven! Yeah. I freaking love Strixhaven. And now looking back on it, after we've been like a few sets down, I uh, best best set of the year, best set of the year for me. Everything about okay, it. Okay, okay, good. Well, no? I like that you've got such a strong. Yeah, no, hey, not disagreeing, not disagreeing. <laughs> not. I like that you. I'm like that you because this is one of the biggest things that I had uh, going into this episode was because we had the two new sets, two old sets, discounting D and D. I wanted to have this big kind of comparison of well, you can't really compare Val and Hunt because I kind of consider them to be one set together, yeah, same and that's kind yeah. of our. Ret- you know what I mean, but comparing cow time and strixhaven that's a big thing i want to get onto and i feel like once we've done our blow by through the year we can kind of look at those two um side by side a little bit more uh, strongly but the fact they both obviously had individual story arcs they had um i guess strixhaven didn't have any new characters in terms of planeswalkers everyone was a returning planeswalker Uh... luca the twins and liliana oh sorry professor onyx so none of them were new which is interesting. I'm really trying. But I guess to they also that. had, you also had five schools that all had their own individual legends that all had their own individual cards. Um, you know, and five schools that. that got really fleshed out as well. Again, we'll talk about this later when it compared to Kaldheim. But yeah, loved yes, it. I remember exactly. all the artwork. It really like changed the way that, um, like magic was perceived, and kind of had a flavor of. So like, so so next year, mm. for example, like I'll, I'll I'll kind of have a theory that I think next year is actually a lot more stitched together than people are going to give it credit for. And I think mm. actually looking overview this year was also thematically stitched very well together in terms of the kind of ideas about characters and and creature types and all that kind of thing. Uh, and I think Strixhaven is the, is the big sort of thing on this. Like not to bury the lead too much. I think things like introducing softer vocations into what the characters of Magic the Gathering can be and do. Things like chefs mm. and musicians and artists yes, and dancers exactly. and singers and poets and things. And they carried that through into Adventures into the Forgotten Realm as well. Like, mm. yeah, Strixhaven, for me, as much as I really love in Australia, as much as I love Kaldheim, like, we'll talk about it maybe more in depth a little bit later, as we say. But yeah, for me, Strixhaven, easily best set of the year. 
Yeah, I feel like it had that Eldraine vibe of where it kind of brought magic down into like the again. I don't know if it's if it's just my I had Lorwyn feels from it, but it all feels much more grounded. Who knew? Who would have thought that Harry Potter set would sell so well in Magic? You know, who well, it's because it that's... was not a Harry Potter set anymore. And I exactly, think a, I think that was a very good decision, a hastily made uh, but correctly made. And I think they just dis- distanced themselves enough from Harry Potter without relying on Harry Potter too much. Mm. Um, good move. I'd say they didn't yeah. try and plow ahead with it, which is which is probably the right call. I agree. I think yeah, in general they resonated a lot more with this. Uh, I think they had this idea of like, who do you want to choose? I mean, I feel like the marketing around it as well was quite good. Like, which school you're going to choose? But it doesn't. It's not like a rivalry. It's about representation rather than um, competition. That kind of thing I thought was really cool. Yeah. Um, and also then five versus ten when you're trying to fit it all into one set. That's like obviously going to be a big uh, point of comparison. When we when we talk about Caldheim and Strix. Um, Obviously, alongside Strixhaven, there was a Mystical Archive, uh, 63 yep. reprinted instants and sorceries, uh, kind of like its own secret lairish kind of... Well, no, because they did a secret lair for it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, also, but it, you know what I mean? Is It kind of felt like the first time they went, it's a set within a set kind of thing, because mm. they didn't necessarily do it with Caldheim, and they didn't do it with either of the Innistrads, really. I know, obviously, showcasing um, borders is going to be a thing going forwards anyway, but it was kind of, I, I wonder what the next one will be. Because I guess they did it with, in, it was Invocations, right? With um, uh, Amon Ket. Yeah. And, the, and then they did the Inventions in Kaladesh. Expeditions And then they did the Expeditions for Zendikar. And also in the original Zendikar, um, they did the Expeditions as well. Yeah, the original, yeah, yeah. Um, The original one. So I, I'd be interested to see what they do the next one. Um, I guess. Um, I Nuke no Penna. What... They'll do what? Yeah. No ones. Oh god, they will, won't they? Mm-hmm. I wonder what they'll do. Art- I guess they can't do what. Art- well, again, we'll, we'll, we'll speculate that going forwards. But I think really, really cool. I mean, we had a lot to say about the Mystical R Five in general. We did a whole separate episode on it. I think it was really clever to have this almost in world, in set library of cards, and was again the the meta commentary, the flavor of how they would look at others, other magic from other planes, and how yeah. they would describe it and talk about it. It's so interesting. These are the kinds of things that feel much more um that makes sets feel more grounded and feel more um lived in rather than just going ah these these 10 other worlds that kind of happen over there and none of that has any relevance do you know what i about mystical archives that looking back on it again not necessarily diving too deep into it like uh, individually but looking back back at it as a drop in a larger ocean for 2021 i this isn't a complaint by the way I, i love that they did this i just don't know why they did it why did they do japanese versions of them that's really weird. That's really weird that they did that. Also, <laughs> they, they did they Japanese did, versions. Because they also did this with the um, Godzilla, right? They did not, not only did they do Japanese versions, um, but they only did three of them and they were exclusive. But like, which was no, really but, weird. I understand what. No, I understand why they did that because Toho and Godzilla is is all sure. like, Japanese pop culture. But what I'm asking is, Miss Archives, just the the kind of the the English language or like, you know, the oh, I'm going to say standard not because of its localization but because like it was standard to the set. The the kind of standard Miss Archive cards were as you say like a meta commentary on the game that they tied to Strixhaven directly. And then they did all the Japanese versions of the Miss Archive cards. Mm. But, but but, but why? 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 Yeah, I, d- I think even at the time <laughs> we asked, really why? Because I think we said they could have done Germanic versions of Eldraine cards, right? And they could have really led into that European um, kind of. But again, culture. that would have been tied into Eldraine. <laughs> yeah, what was, I guess that's what was co- so like? What was it about Strixhaven that they were like, "This is where we're going to do yeah, the Japanese really version strange, of our right? of our showcase card"? I, mean, I guess not it was less about Strixhaven. It was more about the archive, right? I guess it's more. It's less. I guess it could have been whatever set they did the archive for, they would have done this for instead. I guess it's also magic from other planes, maybe artists from other country. I don't know. Like that's the most tenuous <laughs> kind of. That's that's fan I can think at of. this point. But it only. Yeah. But I, I just I only ask because they did such a good job, like being like, no, these so are good, literally right? pages from the books in the biblioplex that show the spells from the other planes because Strixhaven is a is a school that. Like there is this underlying knowledge that there is magic from other places, you know. Even if not all the students are aware of the multiverse, they understand that mm. there's like annals of magic that isn't necessarily accessible in Arcavius, you know, directly. Um, mm. They were it was so specific that I was just like, okay, cool. And then that's when they're going to do the like all Japanese art, full art, borderless, frameless, whatever you want to describe it. Like again, not a complaint. Foilless, they're all, they're even all, if they are foil. Well, foiled, <laughs> foiled, etched, foiled, and then yeah, foilless. I mean, I've got a, I've got an etched foil 
cultivate from that Japanese mystical archive series. And I, I absolutely adore it. Um, mm. But I just know it wasn't. It was not meant to be like a big comment or anything. It's just no, so funny no, that funny, thinking right. about it, I'm just like I have. I still can't understand why that was the decision yeah. that they made. Hey ho, they they're all gorgeous. So whatever. Exactly. I have a, a foil divine verdict or whatever it is that I can't play anything because it's an absolutely terrible. I pulled two regular versions that of artwork. that. <laughs> divine what? Gambit. Sorry, yeah, Divine Gambit. Yeah, divine it's Gambit, so yeah. stunning. And the thing is, I really, really, really need the Japanese demonic tutor. And it's really, really, really expensive. <laughs> it's so annoying, but it's so good. Uh, yeah, again, I, it's, it's strange. Get, uh, maybe maybe they do this again in the future. Maybe they, I, I'd have to have a look, to be fair. I didn't do a big amount of research into why. And I guess we might not. Uh, there might not be an answer. But um, I guess because they also did this with um, War of the Spark. Yes, War of the but, yeah, but I don't... But that... Uh, again, right. those, like, those, planes, those Planeswalkers weren't... Even though they were literally characters in War of the Spark, the the kind of the idea of the cards themselves wasn't like tied to the plane of Ravnica. Do you know what I mean? The Miss mm. Archive cards are literally the pages of the book. Like you could read them as such. I don't know. Um, you know, whatever. But it was just. It was oh, just I like it. No, I like it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 yeah, because I guess if you're going to go all the way deep on a on a meta commentary like that, then that you also do this little left field kind of swing is very. That's very wizards, really, isn't it? It's like, oh, we've got this perfect idea. Yeah, why don't we fuck with it a little bit? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, good, fantastic. Uh, so, um, so those are the two like you know main standard sets going in for the first. Um, for, I guess for the first quarter, um, and then we don't really have anything big um in terms of like uh, sets and everything well i guess uh the official retirement of planeswalker decks um being replaced by commander decks but we already had commander decks from uh zendikar anyway yeah, we had the fine, ac and kaid uh wyleth wyleth there we go yeah, um and they're whatever. fine i think i think it's better to have more i think the, the, the criticism is god do we need to have this many commander decks and then you realized as as the sets kind of release that they're much more ignorable it's, it's kind of the way of going if you wanted to make the set into a commander deck here's the commander deck you want to be editing it's yeah going... i've i've got no problem with it I, again this is yeah, like the secret exactly. air thing it's like if you want to buy all the commander decks then well that's your wallet uh, it, uh, but otherwise it's just more diversity for more different people like exactly. it does make the mainline commander decks less special but like okay well fine you know we got commander legends also okay yeah i think it's weird that they tied the main uh, commander uh, com- so they not only do they have a uh, commander decks for um crimson vow and um midnight hunt god damn it midnight hunt jesus uh, but they also then tied the commander sets um the big commander set of the year the five decks that were all you know like new cards and everything they tied that also to a plane i think yes, i'm not sure if that's a good that or a bad a thing the first year but yeah again maybe having nebulous random c- commander decks do- isn't as good as having things that feel like they fit within the, the current standard set and you're buying strict no, cards but if and they, then they if perfectly go do, into the deck if they're gonna do two two commander decks per set then they shouldn't tie the five big ones to the plane as well i think that's yeah. a dumb decision but whatever it, it's commander fine exactly you know. Let's see if this happens again next year. They probably will. I don't. I don't know if they will. I guess it depends on how. I guess also the problem with Strixhaven is it was five schools that had their very very clear identity, which meant those five commander decks had a very clear identity. And saying that, they did a very good thing of where they went. How can we make these decks not do what the colors do normally? The blue, sure. the blue red one to a to a degree didn't necessarily because you know spell slinging, spell slinging. But I play every time I play Brina, I'm like, this is such an unwhite black deck. It doesn't feel like a white black deck at all. I'm slapping face with like I guess it feels almost like your Karlov deck, right? If yeah, okay, you throw some life gain gain in there, but then by time six you're smacking someone upside the head for twenty six damage. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I guess so next you know. year it's probably gonna be New Penner, isn't it? Because New Capenna's yeah. got the five mob families the and wedges, three exactly. Color. Which you know, mm-hmm. three color commanders is gonna be fun. Cool. Yes, exactly. Cool. So um then we go on to a second supplemental um set of the year. Um Modern Horizons two. Uh, the first supplemental set, um, interestingly enough, to have set boosters and collector boosters. Um, now, Modern Horizons 1, for me, kind of came and went. I'm, I don't know how it was for you, um, but I didn't really, I didn't have a lot to, to say or, or, or mind about Modern fine. Horizons. It was fine. It was, it's just, it's like anything, isn't it? It's like all these supplemental sets. There's lots of cool flavour in there. There's lots of things that I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, I'm glad that they did it, but, um, you know. The, the big thing that was surrounding all these Modern Horizon sets is that they're printing cards directly into Modern, which is a format I don't necessarily play. Um, I mean, this is the one, right? So this is me remembering. This is the one where they introduced Cassithis or Scythis, which is the, a deck that I now play in, in EDH. The commander yes. is the art 
version of that. So they did like this the sketch versions, didn't they, of a lot of these legendaries? That's where this got <laughs> yeah. introduced, right? Yeah, they went from instead of over um producing artwork and adding all these different flares and different borders, they went, Oh no, 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 give us when you're halfway done with No, it, I love it. I love it. The flavor <laughs> I know, I just text like riling you. The... I love riling you. I love riling you. The flavor you, text is, <laughs> is is a lot of like the production notes and like the, the artistic mm. direction notes. I think that's great. Why not? No, I, I, no, I was joking. I've literally, I've got, I've got an Archon of Cruelty that's um, the regular version. I've got an Archon of Cruelty that's the um, sketch version. And I actually really like the weird scrubbed out um, set symbol. Um, I've got a foil version of Magus of the Bridge uh, that's the sketch version. And again, the different highlights you get on it. I actually really like. I think it's there's one of the biggest. And it's something we don't talk about a lot. Um, the way that we ingest magic right the way that we um kind of feed ourselves is visually right because everything gets released on, on, on screen and we kind of seal the cards first you know throughout spoiler season and we're not going to own every single card i mean this is probably more prevalent to you with again your background with card sorting is there's a big difference between seeing a card on a screen and having it in hand in paper yeah, yeah and i feel like a lot of the different things that they try and do might look on the screen to be either amazing and then fall a little flat or they might look kind of naff and it's not only it's only when you start playing with the weirdly enough to get the full experience for magic the gathering you kind of have to play with the cards and i feel like there's a lot of things that they kind of lean into that can feel a little bit like they don't hit the mark until you get to sit down and go oh okay now i see what they were doing with this yeah um, and again i've got a persist that has a massively reduced um art style it doesn't have any color to it whatsoever it's barely a sketch and again i really like it mostly because of its diversity but also because it has that almost like honest honest less produced kind of quality feel to it um I guess the thing that kind of I was the question mark was how was that thematically tying it into the set of Modern Horizons? But Modern Horizons doesn't necessarily have its own kind of set thematic. No. Like the throwback to old school borders for Time Spiral Moon Mastered made a lot of sense. Whereas with Modern Horizons, it's maybe like, oh, we're just trying new things. But and like, just that, I don't think... think every set does need to have like a really heavy theme. I think that is fine, especially for a set where it's for a format which, you know, forgive us modern players, the, the flavor of it isn't necessarily a selling point of the game as much as it as say it is for like Strixhaven uh, Strixhaven mm. as much as it is for EDH or uh, Oathbreaker or Brawl for example Oathbreaker especially where like one of the big selling points for that format was like you can have Arlen Cord with a moon mist do you know what I mean like it's there was a lot of fun sure. in pairing the the commander of Oathbreaker decks with the, the the spell do you know what I mean whereas modern doesn't have that necessarily unless you're playing like a tribal deck or something um yeah. So I think it's fine. I think that's exactly where they need to put these kind of really sort of out there things. And you know what? Having those um, sketch versions of the art of the art cards of the of the whatever, um, I think highlighted more so the work that the artists do for the game. I think it's almost so given now. It's a given that the art for Magic the Gathering is so great. And it's a given that every set it gets better and better and better. I mean, again, Strixhaven was just the most gorgeous set that they've ever printed. Mm. Um, and so to have Modern Horizons come out with like these sort of sketch versions that are still rad, and any of those in any other game, if you'd obviously if they were like sort of inked and coloured, but like any of those sketch versions in any other game would be like shit. This game looks wicked, and to have those like little art notes and stuff like that is just so cool, and shows where the flavour comes from. I think even Sithis's, um flavor text the the art direction mentions Karametra. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, so. If you had no idea who Sithis was, uh, what plane they're from, you weren't necessarily as, as invested in the lore to um, like see the headdress and like equate that with Karametra and blah 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 blah. blah. Mm. The flavor text on that card would give you an idea, and it's not even flavor text. Do you know what I mean? It shows that this is thought about. The art direction is thought about. The narrative through line is there, even if people think that it's maybe not on the forefront. It put it to the forefront. Do you know what I mean? And I love that. I think it's mm. really good. I think it's also a good example of how like these things don't just come from nothing. You know, there's like a process, like I guess some people might not have um, the appreciation of the artist until they go, crikey, you're right. They went from that to the final product. Like, good God, do they put a lot of work in to make these things. It's like, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I was saying this is a good um, comparison because we might as well do this now. Uh, comparing, say, Time Spiral Remastered to Modern Horizons 2 is like, so it's almost like splitting the difference in terms of what core sets started to do, right? Of where you had the reprint set, um, and Time Spiral Remastered was literally just a reprint set, but it wasn't necessarily reprinting cards that we massively needed into um, into standard, which is what core sets originally supposed to do. In the same fashion, you've got Modern Horizons 2, which isn't, no, it's not releasing 
um, reprints or new cards into standard formats, but it is releasing new and powerful cards that can't sit in standard sets into the com- into commander formats or into you know modern the set that's supposed to be doing things like you know Esper Sentinel um, and cards like that. It's also giving us. Um, Oh, um, a way to give supplemental story, right? Because we got Dak and Blackblade, we got Giraha, um, uh, Gear, Gear Dream to Harder, and that those kinds of um, characters that are th- story throwbacks, as well as getting old school, um, newer, newer school players to kind of understand where certain cards come from. Again, it's got weird kind of um, throwback cards like Healer's Flock, which is white, white, white for a three, three flying life link, where Healer's Hawk was a one, one flying life link for a single white, and they just went. We did it with Lanor Elves. Let's just chuck a little Healer's Hawks together. And it's kind of got that kind of twee, kind of almost punniness to it. You know, it had cards like Late, late to Dinner. And this is just looking at the white cards. I don't know. I, I know we went through the set when we uh, when it first released. Mm. Uh, but looking back at Modern Horizons 2, I think it did the perfect thing of of mixing old flavor, new flavor, powerful cards, like really powerful abilities without overstating itself, without overpowering. Because I felt like Commander, Commander Legends kind of felt like it was a, a touch ham-fisted like a little bit ham-fisted it felt like instead of just going here here's a nice set kind of beat you over the head with it going like hey commander players look at all this crazy shit don't you want all of this lovely stuff whereas modern horizons 2 was a bit more a bit more civil with the way they kind of sat down sat down at the table went just let me just talk you through all the things we're doing with the set i think there's a lot of i think there's a lot to uh to like out of that of a um a supplemental set really really cool um so moving on again God, we're good. We're only just halfway through the year. Um, I mean, thankfully, most of it's um, top ended. Um, so then there's a bit of a break uh, between June and July, and then in July, um, just as we pass the halfway mark of the year, big conversation topic: um, our core set for the year, which I put in massive, massive quotation marks: Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Well, sure. I mean, we did literally do a whole episode, a whole two episodes, I think, on this. So yeah, yeah, but. This was the greatest selling set of magic of all time. Oh, was it really? Yeah, this set sold better than any set has ever sold throughout Magic's mm, history. That does surprise me. I mean, it doesn't surprise me as much as, like, I understand why, because it appeals to D&D players and Magic players, and most, most Magic players and D&D players probably have an understanding of the other game as well. But it surprises me because <sighs> there were some... Just thinking about it now... There are some really, really nice things going on in that set. I love the flavor keywords. I love a lot of the homages to, like, you know, some of the D and D specific stuff. I recently watched um, the first half of Spice Eight Racks uh, yeah. deconstruction, right? So I'm obviously just so it's quite fresh in my memory. Um, but also, maybe it is just me. I don't play with a lot of those cards. In my ADH decks, flavorfully or otherwise. So this is the thing, right? It's normally core sets were supposed to be this kind of this nebulous set that kind of felt divorced from the rest of the of the year to the point of where it would have a different coloured border. Um, it would have um, even where they started trying to make them more interesting. We've had a lot of chuggering to kind of talk about past core sets where they try really hard. It's only usually ones where the story is kind of a bit more pushed, like with the Nicol Bolas, the Elder Dragon kind of set. Was that tw- that was nineteen, right? M19 or M20, I can't remember which one it was. M19. Um, and that one kind of had a bit more of a story kind of aspect to it. Again, they're still doing reprints. They've still got your basic vanilla creatures. You kind of got your boring. It's kind of like the boring set, right? Whereas the thing I like about D and D Adventures of the Forgotten Realm is that it still divorces itself from the main sets because the story application is moot. There is none whatsoever to the point of where they kind of had to flex certain characters to be planeswalkers because within magic law they don't work right so i kind of feel like that disconnectedness kind of was apt for D D um, universes beyond and i kind of feel like it sits in isolation like it has no narrative cohesion the only issue i find is that you how now have to move all of the reprints into the ancillary sets like modern horizons 2 um, or Time Spiral Remastered, which both of which didn't necessarily do that quite so well. So if they do this again, if they do, if they do, because they haven't got a course, they didn't announce a course set for next year, did they? Uh, no. So we haven't got one, which is really interesting, because clearly they felt they didn't need the course set. But I still felt like they cut this set again. It was the best selling set for a reason. I agree with you. It did feel very alien. There's a lot of the cards that don't necessarily feel like they fit into fl- flavorfully into others into other um decks very easily like i think yesterday i was playing a game and someone played the um was playing a party venture 
deck because obviously those two mechanics should have somehow ma- made made the connectiveness. Yeah, that didn't. weird that they didn't. But yeah, that, that that was a really annoying thing. But it was like you know, dragon bard. I'm sat there going, this is so bizarre that it's a dragon bard, just this, kind of this dragon king. Well, yeah, I think. I, do you know what? I think and I'm like, it just you... it just feels so strange compared to the rest of the. When year. we spoke about it at the time. In isolation, it was like, well, no, of course it's fine because it's it's very similar IPs and like there are a lot of the same themes. It's the same company and it's a lot of the same artists, and they've done a very good job of making it feel like a D and D Magic the Gathering set or a Magic the Gathering D and D set or whatever versus other Magic sets, or whatever. Like it did feel different, but the fact that it did slot in quite well, I think I'm pretty sure at the time I was I was fairly up on it. I'm not down on it now. I wouldn't be like, oh, you're playing like a an icing death deck or whatever, or you know. A Brian or deck or this that and the other. I just think it 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 doesn't interest me as much. Like, and I play D anD D, and the actual lore of D anD D doesn't interest me as much as what I get out of D anD D is the kind of much more like fluid, nebulous storytelling that might not have anything. Mm. To, I prefer it as a system rather than like a world to invest in as much. Um, and as much as like I like a fantasy, I'm, it's just not my thing. And I I think it's. The, the best way to illustrate my thoughts and feelings on it is that next year they're doing Commander Legends uh, D&D. The Commander Legends set is going to be D&D based. Yeah, Baldur's Gate, right? Right? Uh, yeah. I have so little interest in that personally. I'm sure it will sell amazingly because Baldur's Gate is very popular with D&D fans. For me personally, mm. who's not like a D&D lore fan, that's a whole Commander Legends set that I'm mm. going to have if Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is anything to go by very little interest in i loved a lot of the art styles in it like um the like the the evolving wilds that's like the the module book cover yes those are really cool the art styles vision and again all of it is really nice there's individual bits of flavor in that set that i love as a part of the whole year of magic the gathering for me for me personally i think you could have lifted out uh afr and i wouldn't Mm. have cared that I really guess that's bad. kind of no, it doesn't because it, it replaced the core set, right? It's supposed to feel like it's not. If you are invested in magic because you like the the arc kind of flowing through all of the cards and then how the interconnected, the, like it again, it's it's not canonically part of the world of magic, so that it, I understand why you feel like it can lift out because naturally it should be able to. Um, I'll be interested to see how you feel about the Lord of the Rings set in comparison, for example, because mm. you're going to have more investment in that, so you might feel like yeah. you get more enjoyment out of having those cards. With your play, play not only playing the set but playing those cards within other decks. But if you are a thematic kind of person, it does alienate itself and it does put, sit itself in isolation. And I think it makes really cool cube, for example. But I think, yeah, I agree. There's a lot of cards that you can't just chuck a random. The amount of times I want to put a, a dungeon descent into a deck, and I'm like, but if I have no other venture mechanic in there, like what? It's just a kind of semi utility land ish. Yeah, like, uh, you know, like yeah, I, I completely feel you. I do think they did a really, really good job, but I think that some of the, um, it gives me faith for their future IPs to kind of know that they can do that faithfully. Whether or not they gave more faith to this or not, because it's still their own product yeah. or not, r- remains to be seen. Yeah, um, I, mean, I do it, agree. It, it's definitely, it's definitely uh, solidified my softening up of uh, universes beyond and other IPs, where I am happy for them to exist. I sound so up myself, but like I've like I've said this time and time again. When we had that first discussion about universes beyond, and I was like really unsure, and I was like, well, I kind of like I'd be into doing like the Lord of the Rings decks versus the Lord of the Rings decks if we're playing EDH, but I'm not sure how I'd feel about you know someone playing like a Gandalf deck against my fucking Karlov deck or whatever else. But actually mm. now I don't care. I really honestly don't give a shit about other people playing universes beyond. Go ham. It's your game. It's it's your game. Play it how you want. Mm. Um, but at the same time. It's also kind of nice, I guess, to know that I have that attitude while still not giving a flying shit about <laughs> AFR or uh, Commander Legends, Baldur's Gate. Um, I don't know, we'll see. Individual cards have made it in, like one or two, but it is very surprising that there's a whole set of magic which I barely bought and haven't really put any individual cards into decks. I think Werewolf Pack Leader, was that an AFR card? Or was that a Modern Horizons 2 card? Uh, Pack Leader, I think, because no, I think it was AFR. Right. I could do it one second. One second. Pr- I'm like I'm 99 percent sure. Uh, pack leader. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. There's that one, and I also have put an evolving world, which arguably does case. look does look just exactly like an Estrad card. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, so fair enough. Um, yeah. I get. Yeah. I guess. I guess it's one of those things. Of it depends on how invested you are. And again, 
best selling set of ever. So, I mean, it, clearly it did a lot of things right. I think it's just kind of interesting as two players that aren't huge. And we've said, we, we I think we clarified this at the beginning of every episode. We talked about um, Adventures in the Forgotten Realm. We are not experts in D&D. We no. have some some engagement and obviously enjoy the world. And but as as a as a view through 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 the magic window, I was like, cool, fine. But yeah, I didn't need to engage with it much more than that. I didn't feel like there was a lot of cards I was desperate to invest in where I normally am with other sets. So that's an interesting an interesting agreement, I think. But again, I think it massively depends on our stance. I really like War, Warhammer, for example. So I feel like my engagement with that is going to be equal to your engagement with Lord of the Rings. And that's both of which are going to be more engaged than, say, the AFR is. Um, interesting. Interesting, mm. um, and then we start kind of we kind of like barrel through to uh, September time. Where we was it? I mean, were we in De- oh, December, September, October, November? Shit, it's only three months ago. A uh, midnight hunt, midnight hunt. Um, and out, obviously also the first ha- half of the double feature, which we've yet to see kind of in play. S- saying that, I've kind of just buried the lead massively. Double feature mm. isn't a curated list. It's just no. both sets shoved it's, together. It's also not a list. So I, yeah, double feature as a product. I thought they were going to do like special arts for it and i know it sounds so fucking entitled doesn't it like entitled <laughs> they've done where they've are done... my special <laughs> artworks wizards <laughs> but i what so this is what i think they should have done with double feature so they're not doing that all the double feature cards are just completely black and white which is fucking madness it's not mm. even stylized black and white they've literally just grayscaled them anyway the what they should have done is they should have lifted out all of those black and white showcase cards from Crimson Vow and Midnight Hunt. Agreed. And put those in as double feature. Absolutely. That's a really simple fix that no one would have given a shit yep. about if they had they known that this could have been the other way. Um, what are they doing? I was psyched to buy a box of double feature when I mm-hmm. thought the concept of it was going to be going a certain way. And having seen them, it's trash. It's utter yeah. trash. Do you reckon they shot their load? Do you reckon they, they looked at the border? Because don't get me wrong, but I think also the... Um, tw- what's it called? Equinox border, and then the what's the what's the vampire border called? Um, I, I think know. they're both. I think there's some of the. I say this about every one of them. I don't know why I keep, I keep saying. But I think they're some of the best. <laughs> like all the borders they've done. Interesting. Okay, here we go then. Um, you think they're some of the best? Do you know when we did our um Crimson Vow uh, episode, and I was going to mm. lead in with like I think this has some of the worst things they've ever done in it, and then I ranted on about Chandra dressed to kill. Was that another one that you had? Another one I had was I thought the showcase border for Crimson Vow is one of the worst uh, showcase borders they've ever done. Really? See, I think if I compare them what I like more, I don't think anything's going to kind of come close to how much I liked Eldritch Moon. I'm sorry, Eldrain stylistically. But I think for thematic, um, thematic, um, uh, fucking what's the word I'm looking for? Cohesion. I think that both of them were really representative of what they were trying to do. I think the Crimson Vow showcase for me looks like a digital card game frame, which oh, really? I know sounds really niche and specific, but the no other card frame that they've done showcase border or showcase frame, oh Christ, mm. has looked to me like something which I could see blitzing across my phone screen but i couldn't see in paper all of them are like i can't wait to see how this looks in paper even the zendikar like uh retro travel poster versions right even that i was like oh this will be interesting to see in paper and even even that's very graphic-y the crimson vow vampire fangs with the kind of gold trim i think coupled as well with the very clean artwork that a lot of them had it it looked like hearthstone and I don't know why. I can't put my finger on it quite why. It just looked a bit too manufactured. And um, the Midnight Hunt showcase frame, I thought was really good. Although I think its closest comparison is the old Drain one. And yeah. for me, especially coupled with the art styles that many of the werewolves had uh, from that set. The werewolves specifically, because obviously the humans also had them because it was the whatever flip, basically, wasn't it? Um, I think the werewolf cards... I've got a Tovalar with the Equinox frame and Altar. It is striking and it is really nice, but it's just a tad too busy. I think oh, if that funny. one if that one existed without the Eldrain one existing, I'd be like Equinox Frame, my favorite one of all time. But I think the Eldrain one, as its closest comparison visually, I think Midnight Hunt is a little bit busy as a showcase. Um, and yeah, yeah, Crimson Vow, I think the worst one for me. Mm, see, I think that's kind of funny because I like I I think all of those things you say like this unnecessary, almost like decadence, almost like. F- f- um, 
almost like fascia to them, like mm. you know that kind of gl- the glam and that kind of thing. I feel like plays into that theme of of Olivia's party was just so extra. It was so de- um, decadent beyond beyond ne- necessity. I kind of felt like it epitomizes that a bit more. I also do agree with what you're saying about the. Um, I do feel like a lot of the werewolf equinox borders. It, I agree, busyness. I think it's same with the black and white. Um, the the black and white cards that were released uh, for both uh, to come back back to our original point um also quite busy with just the black and white starkness on them i feel like some of the artworks just don't pop the right way and i feel like it's interesting that they did both having their own alternate showcases their own alternate art styles as well as we haven't like we'll get to it in a second in terms of the ridiculous number of all alt- arts that were in uh, crimson vow anyway in terms of like dracula and all that nonsense and then on top of that you had the black and white which could have very much just been its double features own specific thing yeah, i feel like they yeah. shot their own they went they knew they wanted to do it they already were printing the cards anyway for the double feature ending. They went, oh, why don't we just also put it in the, the regular set? Because, you know, now we're doing set boosters and collector boosters. Got to make it worth the money. It's like, but now you've just chucked everything all at once. And then it's one of these things, if I look at the two cards together, I can't remember what set we said this for before. But we had, I think it might have been a Coria. If you open up a Godzilla card in one hand and you open mm. up a treatment in the other and you go, what fucking game am I playing? Because which it funny? I- Isn't it funny that a Coria, which was, I think, probably you could track that as being the first proper set where they brought in like multiple showcase styles as opposed yeah. to just the one because we, we we spoke with Vorthos Mike about this um when he came on isn't it funny that that was all the way back then and it's taken them all the way to now to do like what black and white dracula uh and uh showcase frame to do the three mm. and, and then also to do multiple dracula's in multiple art styles mm. Yeah. And this is when you're splitting a set into two sets anyway, right? Like you're already splitting your fourth set of the year into two. And then each individual one has its own ridiculous amount of, I think it almost epitomizes the year, right? Of where they went, oh, we just tried to throw as much as we can into one set. We had to split it into two and it still felt like too much in each individual set of those two sets. Mm. Like that's, that. yeah. I mean, we're rolling kind of into, straight into like, what I mean, these are all very relevant and very recent kind of things. We're rolling into like Crimson Vow, obviously that released um, only only this week mm. um, or last week. So it's, it's interesting that I feel like those two sets, as much as they tried to keep them separate, I think story-wise, obviously there was the Act 1, Act 2, it very much felt like a, a part one, part two in terms of the set. As much, I don't think, even with the double feature aspects, kind of even going against that, they didn't feel like individual sets at all. I feel like it just felt like one bulky, giant set that we Which had I'm, a couple I'm of weeks between. I'm kind of okay with. I'm absolutely fine with. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's to the detriment of either set. I just think it didn't help an already heavy year feel heavier right at the end. I mean, it's again, the year hasn't necessarily finished. <laughs> Right, and that's the thing. I mean, again, like I guess we're going to have um, uh, we had our announcement for next year a couple of a, a couple, you know, a, a month ago ish, and then we're going to have some spoilers for Kamigawa because we can't stop the hype train uh, ahead of Christmas. That would be silly. That'd be stupid. Yeah, you can't stop the hype train across Christmas. They've got to release no. every single product they possibly can. You know, it's not as if we already had already haven't had a look at what Infinity is going to look like, and now we're going to get Kamigawa. <laughs> like, it's not as if we're looking into two sets from next year in a set in a, in a year that already had seven sets. Um, uh... Yeah, it's fine. And that seems like a pretty good place to leave off part one of our year in review. Join us next week where we look at more specific examples of what made this year great and in some parts not so great. You can find us on Twitter at MTFlavoring. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Andy Manface. Nathan's is at the Fox and the Moon. And emails go to MTFlavoring at gmail.com. All that remains for me to say is thank you so much for listening. This has been Magic the Flavoring.